recap to MSP Culture uh, episode four. Um, I got a lot of great feedback from episode three, so thank you so much to everybody out on Reddit and LinkedIn that you know reached out, gave me some uh, feedback, gave me some ideas for future episodes. Um, for this episode, I want to talk about something called the broken windows theory. Um, you know, I wrote about this probably a year ago on my LinkedIn, so if you want to go read a little bit about it, feel free to. Uh, it's on my LinkedIn, uh, Jordan Silva, but. I figure it would be a good time to start talking about it and maybe revisit the idea a little bit and its implications in what we do. Um, a little background. Broken windows as a thing is a theory from, I, don't know, I think the, like the, in the 80s or something like that, uh, in regards to criminology and just general human behavior. Uh, it was a big deal in New York City and some other places. And the idea is basically that if you go to an area and you let little problems exist like broken windows in a building um, people in that area will understand that you don't really care about it and will increase the problems um, if they don't see that you're addressing the small things they'll assume you don't care and they'll start doing bigger things and then you have bigger problems um, the story that kind of goes along with a lot of this are some of the the success stories are things like the uh, the transport agency or the transportation agency, um, the Rail Transit Authority, I think is what it was called, and their attempts to get rid of things like graffiti and fare jumping and things like that, where uh, when they were seeing that people were um, tagging up their, their um, train cars and the subway cars, uh, they made an effort to make sure that within 24 hours they got those things repainted. And what it showed was, or at least in their theory, was that if they cared about things like that, other crime would decrease as a result because people understood that they were taking it seriously, uh, that there was a presence to enforce some of the laws, and as a result, bigger crimes dropped around the same time. Now, there's a lot of controversy around whether or not this was real uh, in New York City at the time, and if it was the actual cause and effect relationship people wanted it to be or if there were other factors at play. I mean, in a city that size or in places that big, yeah, it's not gonna just be one thing that drives down crime. Um, but from my perspective, I think it contributes and it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so I wanted to kind of talk about how it applies to managed services, to businesses, to what we deal with on the day to day, and why even if it's a flawed criminology policy, uh, it's still maybe a good idea from a management perspective. So um, let's dive in. Okay, so if broken windows is about taking and preventing small problems uh, or fixing small problems in an effort to prevent big problems, the first thing we really need to do is start to understand what those small problems are. Uh, as a manager, there's a handful of things that we're trying to you know, prevent in a workplace uh, or make happen, I guess. Uh, we want efficient employees, we want happy employees, uh, we want happy customers, so and we want to be profitable. That's kind of the gist of it. Uh, so when we're looking for small problems, we want to identify things that sort of lead to the big problems that prevent those things. Uh, let's just start with efficient, efficient people. Uh, happy and efficient people are going to drive most of the other stuff. If you have happy and efficient employees, there's a pretty good chance you're going to have a successful business. Um, if your employees are efficient and you don't have a profitable business, it's probably not the employee's fault, so you need to go look elsewhere. So we'll just start with efficient employees. Uh, in managed services, an efficient employee, uh, or we measure efficiency of employees mostly by time utilization. So I know if you're listening to this and you're probably an engineer and an MSP, you might hate time entries. Um, I like time entries. Even when I was an engineer and on the help desk and all that stuff, I enjoyed writing time entries because it gave me a sense of kind of purpose at the end of the day. Uh, so we can talk about that in another episode and why I really, really like time entries. But for the sake of this episode, we're just going to go with time entries have to exist and they are how we're going to calculate utilization of employees and therefore their efficiency. In a broken windows type environment, um, time entry quality and quantity are going to be the small windows generally. If you can get people to enter their time effectively, on time, and accurately, you're gonna prevent a lot of problems. So let's kind of talk about why that is. Uh, time entries serve a handful of purposes. If you're an engineer or on the service desk or any technical role, the main reasons you keep time entries are, one, they're a technical record of the work you did. So if somebody has questions about what you did or didn't do or why or when, 
they can just look at the records. Um, they help, so if you're out sick or on vacation, no one has to follow you and bug you to see what changes you made. Uh, they help you remember what you worked on last time, so when you continue troubleshooting, you know, uh, you can see where you left off. From a managerial perspective, they help understand where people are kind of going wrong in the training still because we can identify where people went off the rails a little bit. Uh, they help us understand how long tasks actually take. Uh, we can look at a project and say, okay, well, I thought it only took 40 or 50 hours to install this type of server. According to the time entries in the last five projects, it actually takes 60 or 70 hours and we can adjust our quoting. So if you don't have time entries, and those are the results of good time entries, the result of no time entries would be the lack of that stuff. Uh, from a project budgeting perspective, if we're relying on our time entries to give us a truth about how long it takes us to do things in general, without that, it means, generally speaking, our quoting will be wrong, either under or way over. If our quoting is way over, our close rate will be low because our product will be very expensive comparatively. If our quoting is way under and we're not bidding enough hours, our profit will be really low. So you could struggle with, I don't know, figuring out how to accurately guess better, or uh, you can push people to accurately account for their time, which is a much easier thing to control. And the net result is you now have a place to go back and sort of see what happened and what was taking up time and prevent the problem. Um, if we continued on that path with things like projects, you can also look at where time savings can be made or what portions of projects are taking up the most amount of time and looking at making those portions more efficient. And as you make more and more portions of a large task more efficient, the task as a whole becomes more efficient and you can actually lower the total cost of that project. It's a really quick and easy example to sort of understand why doing the really small thing, the making sure someone is accounting for their time properly on projects, leads to the much bigger result, which is a profitable project. As we kind of expand on that, if our projects are profitable, generally that means that we can be competitive or if they're accurately bid, we can be competitive and we'll get more sales and that drives business growth. And that at the end of the day is usually what most people want out of their MSP um, from a owner perspective. For the customer, it means that they're not being gouged and their expectations are kind of set from the start. If you tell them it's gonna take, you know, 100 hours or $10,000 or whatever bid you give them, I prefer to give them a price bid, not an hours bid. Um, they kind of know what that means. Uh, they understand what their hourly rates generally are. So even if you tell them it's gonna be $10,000, they'll do the math in their head and they'll understand, okay, it'll take about this much effort. Uh, and they'll usually take a pretty good guess at how long they expect you to be working on stuff. And that helps them understand the time frame of a project and you know the scope of the project. A really expensive project tends to be really big. Uh, a cheaper project tends to be small and so on. So from the start, if you're able to accurately estimate projects based on a good historic representation of how long the projects really took, then from start to finish, you're a little bit better off. If we go down the path of service delivery, so managed services delivery, understanding how long things take, um, even outside of just the general technical record of what people are doing to help them solve problems in the future, but just understanding how long we're taking on things like virus cleanup helps us understand when we need to invest in tools better. Now, without time entries, you can you know look at every tool on the market every time they come out and try to guess and see is this tool better than what I currently have? You can do a bunch of research and ask people and say, hey, you know, um, what tools are you using? How long does it take you to do stuff? But you have no real indicator of how much you're spending on those things. Uh, you can ask your staff and they'll say, yeah, we have tons of problems or no, we have no problems, but it's gonna be kind of an emotional reaction to things, which is nearly always inaccurate. Um, or we go back to, the small thing, which is have people just account for their time, and then you have all the reporting you need to understand, hey, there has actually been an uptick in malware. It's time to invest in new tools based on this information. And that's kind of the, the gist here. So timekeeping and efficiency is pretty straightforward. People keep track of time. You use that information to build clients effectively, but also to set your pricing. If you understand how long it takes you to do stuff, you can accurately set your pricing and you start or you prevent yourself from running into issues with just not having enough profit at the end of the day to pay the bills, pay all the employees, and pay for the business, and turn a profit to make the business worthwhile to keep. So that's how time entries kind of fall into place with this broken windows concept. It's all these outcomes that are a result of not having time entries 
individually would take a lot to sort of fix or to prevent on their own. If you were sitting there trying to figure out why you weren't profitable with no record of how much time it was taking, you know, you'd be left guessing. Is it your pricing that's too high? Is it your staff that's too inefficient? Is Are your clients just super needy? Like there's a lot of things that you just wouldn't have answers for because you just don't have the data to help you. Uh, if you're trying to guess why projects aren't profitable, you're in the same position. Am I just not bidding enough? Or are we, you know, are we just really slow with this? What are we doing wrong? Why do these even keep dragging out? You have all these issues that you could try to tackle, but without the data, one, you're gonna be taking just wild guesses to begin with. But two, um, even if you came to a conclusion, you'd have no way to validate that what, whatever change you make actually improves your situation easily. So you go down the road and you take the easy thing to fix, which is timekeeping. It's a very small problem. And with that, if you teach your staff that this is something you really care about, they'll understand that if you care about these little details, then you probably care about the big things also, like profitability. Um, staff as a whole will kind of support whatever you as the leader care about. Uh, it's a natural thing. They're generally not going to go out and just, you know, say, oh, well, my boss cares about this, so I'm going to disregard that. Even if they're an average employee and not like some rock star, they're going to say, oh, my boss cares about this, so I'll probably care about this because that's how I'm going to get praised. That's how I'm going to get rewarded. That's how I'm going to get a raise. You know, even from a selfish perspective, if they care about what you care about, they'll be rewarded for it. So showing that you care about something as simple as time entries helps them understand that you care about the bigger picture. Okay. Now that we kind of understand what a broken windows sort of problem is and how it relates to MSPs, let's really dive into this and how managed services really, really matters in a broken window situation. If the idea is that you can prevent big problems by fixing small problems, you have to understand that that is basically why managed services, all you can eat style agreements exist. That is your differentiator, that is your selling point, that is you know, the bread and butter of what you should be explaining to customers. For a typical customer uh, on a break fix style agreement, it's pretty rare that they will allow you to spend a lot of time fixing a small problem. For example, if every Tuesday at 3 p.m. a map drive disconnects, you know, they log off the computer and log back in uh, and the drive is back. The likelihood that they let you spend more than an hour on something like that and they're willing to pay you is pretty low. Now, from your perspective, it's an annoyance. From their perspective, it's an annoyance. They're not super happy because they asked you to look at it and you weren't able to really fix it uh, in the time they thought it should take to fix. But they're unwilling to spend more money on it. So now forever, they're just going to keep dealing with that problem. That lowers their overall happiness and their perception of their IT department. Even though you're willing to look at it more if they would just pay you, it doesn't matter. They're going to sit there and be like, yeah, that thing always breaks every Tuesday. I hate our IT guy. Um, as a managed service provider, if you have an all-you-can-eat all agreement with them, you can kind of jump in there and sort it out. If, say, for example, the reason that problem was happening is because of something bigger, say every day or every week that thing drops out because that's the time some type of backup job runs or some snapshot is taken or some other weekly reoccurring event is happening that interferes with the network, um, it could be an indicator of a bigger problem. Maybe there's some type of conflict that's happening and it's actually causing other issues. I've seen problems in the past where People are backing up, you know, a hypervisor uh, that's also a live server. I mean, people do silly things all the time. But anytime the hypervisor would get backed up, it would actually disconnect the virtual machines running in it because it needed to pause them in order for the backup to be successful. By doing that, it was causing problems within a database, and eventually they had some corrupt data on their hands because if stopping a database randomly that's running within a virtual machine on a hypervisor that's also running with live data uh, is not a great, a great way to do things. And, you know, the problem went on for months because the client didn't want to pay for people to look into why this was happening. It was a small annoyance. Things would go down for a, like a minute or two every once in a while. Uh, but they wouldn't pay for someone to really dive into it. Had they paid for that broken window to be addressed, the small problem, they wouldn't have lost data long term because that would have prevented the big problem. As a managed service provider, you need your customers to understand this broken windows policy and this broken windows kind of theory. 
your job is to fix the broken windows as a managed service provider with some type of all you can eat agreement. You want customers to understand that your mission is going to be to fix the small problems before they become big problems. That your job is to care about these small things so they never become big things and show their staff that you do take this stuff seriously. You're not going to tolerate a printer not being mapped when they log in. You're not going to tolerate small issues like map drives dropping every day. <laughs> uh, I actually have a buddy who's map drives do drop every day and his IT person hasn't fixed it in the two years that he's worked for the company or something like that. Uh, <laughs> so he hates it and he complains about it and he has to work through it every day, but it happens. So uh, he's a pretty good example of exactly what happens when you don't care about these broken windows. Now for the hard part. How do you get your staff to understand why you're nagging them about these little mundane things? Um, Okay, it's not actually that hard. You just tell them. Explain to people that you care about things and why you care about them. I like to be very clear with people about what I care about. Uh, I just got a handful of new staff recently. They moved from another team over to mine. And the first thing I did with them was I sat down and I took out a PowerPoint presentation that I had that says, hi, welcome to the team. Um, I explained that I cared about a handful of things and most of them seem pretty basic. Uh, one of them includes being on time for meetings. I care about being on time more than most people, I think. I think that it's how we show respect for each other in a meeting. I think it's the best way to get a meeting off on the right foot. Uh, if you show up late, I think everybody is just annoyed with you at that point, or they think that you're not taking it seriously. So I think there's all kinds of problems that exist when you don't show up on time for meetings. So the way I let people know that I want them to show up on time for meetings is I say, hey, I take this really seriously. I want you to show up on time for meetings and here is why I believe this to be the thing. Um, I tell them that I care about them being happy. I take being a manager pretty seriously. Uh, I didn't always, I thought it was kind of a joke of a job with, when I was younger. I mean, I didn't think it was a hard job. I, I learned very quickly that it is a super hard job. So now I take it pretty seriously and I explain that. I take their happiness and their success very seriously. And that's how you get them to understand why you're nagging about small stuff. I tell them I nag about things like time entries because I understand the value of them and I tell them about the value of them. I care about showing up on time. I care about them being happy. Um, there's lots of other things that I care about, but they're bigger pictures, you know? I, I care about profitability a lot. I wouldn't be in my position if I didn't care about profitability because no one would hire me. Um, I care about successful customers and happy customers. Uh, I don't have to focus on profitability because if I focus on happy employees and happy customers, profit will come. I trust that the people who set prices for me are doing their job properly and they're not going to drive us out of business. So as long as I can keep my employees happy and eff efficient through time entries, through just general, you know, good management, and I can keep our customers happy because I have great employees taking care of them, the money will come in. I don't have to focus on those pictures, those those ideas. Like I don't have to point out that profitability is important to me. Everybody who's ever worked for any business ever knows profitability is important. Um, so I tell them that I care about these little things, these very core fundamental things, and that's where I'm gonna focus most of my energy because everything else is a result of those things and they seem to get it. Some get frustrated because I really do harp on small things. Um, I think that it makes a difference, but over time, I think people get it. So just have the discussion with your team. Tell them that you're gonna focus on this little stuff because you believe it'll prevent the big issues from coming up. Tell them that you're gonna focus on the little stuff and you want them to focus on the little stuff because it'll prevent them from running into bigger problems. And I think everybody will walk away pretty happy. So check out the LinkedIn article, check out the Wikipedia. I'll link them in the podcast notes to make it easier to find. So if you just check out podcast.mspculture.com and you look up episode four under the notes that I can punch in, I'll put links to all this stuff so you can read more about it. Um, and that kind of wraps up episode four. Before I go, uh, I wanna announce contests we're having. So we've been doing really good actually for the first three episodes. Uh, I was actually really surprised at how many people are downloading it and subscribing, so I wanted to have a little contest. Um, one of my favorite authors is Scott Stratton. I dig most of his books, so I'm going to give away one of them uh, to celebrate our thousandth download. Uh, we're, we're at just under 500 downloads currently after the first three episodes, so probably by the end of episode five we'll be at a thousand if things kind of keep up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post uh, this on LinkedIn. And if you come and find the post for either episode four or episode five, 
on LinkedIn. Episode 5 will be sometime next week. And you like the post and leave a comment. I'm just going to add your name to a list and then I'll randomly draw a prize for one of Scott's books. I haven't decided which one yet. Um, I own all of them. They're all pretty good. Uh, I probably won't decide until uh, it's time for the drawing. Yeah. And if we get to, let's say, 1,500 downloads before the fifth episode or by the fifth fifth episode, uh, maybe I'll give away two books. So come find me on LinkedIn. Uh, like the post. Uh, leave a comment so I know that you're there. I'm not super good at tracking this stuff. This is going to be a pretty casual contest. And if you win, I'll hit you up. I just really need a way to contact you. That way I can uh, give you your prize. So yeah, uh, be on the lookout for episode five next week. If you're listening to this, you already found episode four. Thanks for tuning in. Um, And see you guys all later. Have a great day.